Hello, I'm Jeremy Diesel, Director of Communications for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, and we'd like to take some time to just sort of update you on the situation with COVID-19 and the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I'm joined right now by Executive Director Brian Collier. Mr. Collier, thank you for taking a minute. Probably the easiest way to begin, it's, it's been a while since we've had one of these updates, and certainly we're seeing now a, a real surge in the state of Texas regarding COVID activity. How does that apply to the agency? How's the agency faring so far? Thank you. Uh, well, within TDCJ, we've seen, uh, we saw in the middle of the summer, the height of our COVID activity as far as number of positives, uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic positives, both on uh, inmates and our employees as well. We saw that number decline substantially throughout the end of the summer and drop down to really low numbers this fall, which was good, but we also knew the second wave was potentially coming. So we've spent that time preparing and also monitoring the communities around Texas, looking for when those hot spots occur, what actions we can do. Uh, we are seeing our numbers climb. Uh, much of those numbers, the raw numbers, are actually the result of a lot of testing that we've been doing, and the majority of our uh, inmates that we have identified as positive or asymptomatic, same with our employees, but continue to do aggressive testing to identify where the virus may be. The TDCJ really has been on the cutting edge, really of this pandemic as far as response and what can be done uh, to combat it. Specifically, starting that first and, and really largest mass testing program of both offenders and staff that we've seen anywhere in the country. W what's the status of that program? I know there have been some changes and it's being approached a little differently now. We started testing in May, uh, as you know, and I mean, we started going across all our facilities doing testing of all the inmates as well as the staff. And then we began uh, modifying as we as we learned from the testing. Uh, we started a model where we have a we have four select units that have the majority of our geriatric offenders. We test they, those locations every week, uh, and then if we get a full clear for at least two weeks, we go on to a testing of those employees every other week. Uh, the, so we have that we call somewhat of a modified nursing home model for prisons. We've continued to reserve the right to do mass testing at any location if we've seen symptomatic testings, but recently we started actually a random model where every unit in the system is being tested every three weeks on a random basis. Random meaning that we've identified a random number of inmates and a random number of employees based on working with our medical partners and the epidemiologists that work with them to give us the advice on what would be the best way to identify the virus. And that's the model that we're moving forward. Uh, we're doing that now, but again, based on what we identify through those random tests, we would then deploy mass testing if necessary. And again, we reserve the right still uh, to do mass testing anywhere if we see symptomatic positives come up. We also are watching closely with community uh, act activity. So if a community area such as right now, it's been, we've seen it in parts of West Texas. So our units in West Texas, as we saw those communities begin to increase positive rates in the communities, we took additional steps for our units in those locations. And how, how do the results really compare now as far as the, the testing rate and the positivity rate coming back and forth? How does that compare now to what we saw really at, at the height of the, the pandemic as it impacted TDCJ back in June? I think we saw as our numbers declined, I think in the community numbers declined as well, we saw our uh, test results largely coming back negative, which was good. Uh, what we're beginning to see now is as we've had in those communities where we see increases or upticks in, in positive rates, we're seeing upticks in some of our positive rates with our inmates and staff in those locations as well. So, But our regular random testing is still continuing. If you took it across the system look, you're still finding more negatives at this time. You look at the big picture. Testing is far from the only innovation or change that has happened that's been prompted by the pandemic. There are all sorts of things that TDCJ has been taking on and, and doing a little differently. One of those is this um, product called Vital Oxide, which is a, a disinfectant that we're now using and have been using for, for quite some time. What, what can you tell me about Vital Oxide and where and how it's being used? Vital Oxide is a stable solution that basically is a disinfectant that can kill COVID, bottom line. It can also be applied. You can apply it like you could apply anything in a spray bottle but on a large scale application, you can apply it with a fogger, uh, meaning that you can use a piece of equipment that actually turns it into a vapor uh, that will actually not leave things moist or, dry or wet and will dry within a few minutes. And that application of that vital oxide can kill any existing COVID that it may touch. 
So we have been since uh, several months ago when we were able to actually acquire vital oxide through the State uh, Department of or Division of Emergency Management. We were actually able to continue that um, procurement with vital oxide as well as the equipment, and we're testing at all of our, or not testing, but using it at all of our locations around the state as a disinfectant. We still do bleach, water, things like that to disinfect. We still do all the things we were doing before, but on, in addition to that, the units that are using vital oxide, which are across the system, or vital oxide, vital oxide will be applied at least every three days. In some cases, it's applied daily, or they rotate through the unit every day. Uh, but vital oxide is one of the other steps and tools that we've been able to acquire as we uh, dealt with this pandemic. Now, obviously, there are uh, a significant number of precautions that are taken across the board, whether in office settings like this or, or in the units when it comes to sanitation, when it comes to mandatory mask usage. Obviously, we're socially distanced from each other in this interview, so we're uh, foregoing the masks for now, but we'll put them right back on when we're done. Um, how do we assure that those things are actually being done? We have a protocol for that as well, right? We do. We started this summer with something called compliance assessment teams, and we identified staff within the agency that could be part of audit teams to go out and actually make sure we're doing what we say we do. Uh, they And they go out. Initially, we, we touched every unit in the system as well as every office location in the system with a CAT team. CAT teams went out, assessed how well those locations were doing on mask compliance, on sanitation, on the mixing of chemicals, the use of vital oxide, and all the other protocols that we have in place from employee screening to contract tracing and the things that we need to do as far as dealing with COVID. Those teams went through initially and helped educate, make sure everyone was doing it right. We've moved well past the education phase to the point where we're now randomly showing up unannounced and going through and doing full-fledged audits, audits of which I receive a report on each week the warden or department head at that location would also receive a report, as would their respective divisions. Any deficiencies identified have to be immediately followed up on, and then action plans are developed for them to make sure that they're in full compliance. So those have been an extra way that we can just go out and make sure we're doing what we say we're doing, because really following those protocols is critically, critically important at this time. So right now, the number of facilities and inmates that are impacted by precautionary lockdowns is only about a quarter of what it was back at the, the height of things back in June. Back then, there were 50 units, nearly 50,000 uh, offenders who were impacted by that. Uh, there have been some innovations on that front, though, to also make those lockdowns at least a little less difficult. Some things that have been produced by the agency. What are some of those things? Some of the things we did, and we learned early on, is our typical lockdown, when we've had to lock down units, sack lunches or the way, sack meals are the way we have to deal with that. We uh, did that for the first part of this pandemic, and we know that that grows old, and that's not the most effective way to provide meals. So providing hot meals to everyone, even in that environment, became a critical item that we wanted to address. We did that through manufacturing our own food trays and insulator lids that would allow us to do that. Uh, we've gone through our manufacturing and logistics, agribusiness and logistics division, manufactured um, enough food trays and insulator trays so that all our units in the system could have a way to essentially make a hot meal, prepare it and keep it warm while they delivered it to the population in their cell or in their dorms rather than have to do sack lunches. So that's been a, a big step forward. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's important what you eat every day is critically important, and we know the quality of that uh, needs to be where it is, and, and having a hot meal adds to that as well. Uh, in addition to that, we've had our risk managers on every unit, not just monitoring our sanitation, but also monitoring food and, and the food that we're serving and how well we're doing. So we all know the importance of the connections between family on the outside and inmates on the inside. Um, that has huge impact for both sides of the fence there. So having visitation be suspended since March, uh, that's obviously a significant impact on all of those, but there are things that we're doing differently to, to try to at least mitigate that somewhat to help with that. The most important thing is we understand the impact visitation has on everyone, uh, and it's not something that we take lightly. Uh, we have scrambled behind the scenes to try to find ways that we could expand connectivity with families. That included phone activity that has increased, but then also 
trying to do video visitation, which is not easy. Video visitation, we had a small footprint of video visitation that had not actually become operational since it has become operational, but we've broadened that footprint substantially with our own use of a tablet technology that we're actually doing in-house and deploying to units. We first tried it in the Huntsville area. We've expanded it now to other units, and we are continuing to expand that throughout the system because we know that is critically important, and we are doing the best we can to try to expand that because we do know how important that is, and we want to return to a state of normalcy and visitation and things like that in the agency. That helps all of us, and, and we understand that, and we understand the pressure that that puts on everyone, but at the same time, we are trying to do different alternatives that would give you something, uh, th and those are alternatives that we don't necessarily think will go away. Uh, after live visitation returns, but we want to offer that now as best we can. And I realize uh, patience is something we continue to ask for, but we just ask for patience from those family members and, and our inmates just right now as we try to continue to do that. And there really are significant technological challenges and also security challenges when it comes to trying to establish a program like that. On top of that, you're trying to do it during the time of COVID. So you have units that may have COVID activity, to bring in a third party vendor to come in and, and put conduit in or things like that to do video visitation. This is not the time when that can work out very well. That's why we ended up going out on our own and just building our model that we have in, in house. Now, we continue to look at other opportunities and we'll continue to explore those, but uh, the video visitation, ex ex extra phone calls, um, we also have our chaplains heavily involved and our chaplains have been able to, uh, where we've had precautionary lockdowns go in write a note to the inmates' loved ones, call the loved one, let them know what that message is, and then relay a message back to the inmate from their family. We try to do that as well. We certainly understand that's not the same as a visit, uh, but we're trying our best as well we can. But those, just those messages alone, there have been more than 100,000 of those already. Significant numbers of those and significant numbers of video visitation since we've started. And again, that runs all week. That's not just a two-day-a-week activity. Uh, and we continue to broaden that and we'll get information out on our website as we add additional units. And, and on that same note, uh, obviously with a horrific pandemic like we have, there are significant numbers of deaths that have occurred yes. both on the outside and sadly on the inside as well. But there are also some efforts being made that are innovative to try to at least create some level of connectivity in a end of life situation on, on both sides, right? Yes, we've used FaceTime. Uh, our wardens have used their, their work phone and, and others on the units to do FaceTime so that we can have families connect with someone, with a loved one who's in or vice versa. We've had uh, people who may be in a good time when we could go outside the facility, their, their loved one may have been eligible to go to, on a furlough to a funeral. Uh, in this environment, we're not able to do that, so we have tried to FaceTime uh, with the family as much as we can. We also offer the opportunity to, to provide a video so that the inmate can watch a video of the services. but. Uh, we've tried our best to stay uh, focused on that as we can, and we, uh, again, are trying to be as um, proactive and compassionate as we can in those arenas. We've talked about it a little bit, but uh, obviously in Texas right now, there are several places that have significant outbreaks going on in the community outside of our facilities. El Paso comes to mind. The, the Panhandle area comes to mind as well. Are, are there any other additional things that are being done to try to improve um, the situations for folks, whether that's upgrading masks or anything like that? Uh, what we started doing, and we started it in El Paso, uh, we've done it with the West Texas areas that have been increases in community positives, is that we have put our in, uh, inmates and staff in N95 masks. So that's a mask that's upgraded beyond. The CDC doesn't necessarily say that that's what you need to do. We have twofold reasons for that. One, it's, the, it's an ultimate layer of protection for those, and we know we're in active areas, but also our employees are encouraged to use that mask in the community. And that's where our risk is. Our risk is bringing it in from the community to the facility. So by wearing that N95 mask in the community, we hope that our staff are safer, and we hope that we're lowering the, the likelihood that they're gonna bring it back into the facility. Uh, that can't not be overemphasized right now. Uh, the critical nature of staying COVID free is doing the protocols and being extremely vigilant about following those protocols. Obviously, there's that big push to make sure that all of us are taking those precautions to stop that transmission. It, it didn't start inside a prison. It had to get there from the outside in the first place. So what message do you have 
to all of those thousands of employees that we have that are in the community, but also going to their jobs, going to their work, especially with the holidays coming up. First thing I would have to say to our employees is thank you for the heroic uh, efforts you've made throughout this whole event. Um, I have never been prouder to work uh, with a team of men and women in my life than I have been during this event because of the extreme efforts you've made, your heroism in showing up every day and going into units where exposure is there. But for all of us, what really has to hit home is our personal responsibility in all of this. Uh, we have to wear our mask. We have to limit where we go. We have to think through our holiday plans. We have to really think about those gatherings and try to decide are they worth it and if they're going to be happening, are we doing it in the safest manner we possibly can? Are we sanitizing? Are we washing our hands regularly? All those original information um, messages that were provided by the CDC as well as our correctional managed health care policies still fall into place that it's not that complicated. Wearing the protocols such as the mask, washing our hands, using hand sanitizer if we need to and can't wash our hands, those are the key elements and staying in a safe distance from people um, even when you're in the mask I think is wise. But at the same time, monitor what we do outside. Uh, for many of us it's work and home and that's it. And that's our exposure and that's where, and then if other people come into that, you need to be thinking about where have those people been and what was their exposure. And just be smart, be wise, and be safe. Mr. Collier, thank you for taking some time for us to uh, get us updated on the COVID situation. Uh, we will, of course, continue to try to bring you updates as often as we can to keep everyone abreast of the COVID situation. But for now, everybody should mask up and keep in mind, we're in this together. Mm -hmm.